Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our next uh, Space Fan Hangout. With me today, I have Dr. Sarah Seeger from MIT. She's an astrophysicist and planetary scientist from uh, from MIT, and she's gonna she's with me here today to talk about exoplanets in habitable zones. And in particular, there's been a very exciting discovery that's just minutes old. Actually, it's two. It's 2.35 on the East Coast right now, and I think uh, the announcement went out about 35 minutes ago. Um, so it's this brand new discovery that we're going to discuss uh, uh, and, and also take your questions. Now, before I get started on the introductions, I want to let you guys know that you can interact with us in, in, in the following ways. Um, you can comment on the Space Fan uh, event page where this is being broadcast. You can also comment on the YouTube channel page where this is uh, being broadcast on YouTube. You can twit, tweet your questions and comments uh, using the hashtag SpaceFan, which I have in my little uh, my little banner right here. So uh, if you, so I'll be monitoring all three of those places and we're going to get to your questions and comments a little bit later on. And I just want to also mention that you might notice someone's missing today. Uh, Alberto Conti, Dr. Conti, the uh, JWST innovation scientist that usually joins me on these uh, has had knee surgery on Tuesday and he is still recovering so while he had hoped he could be here uh, he unfortunately can't make it he told me he's uh, laid up um, uh, sort of just sort of waiting for the pain to subside so Alberto if you're watching we miss you we hope to get you next time uh, so you can join us uh, uh, on the next hangout which will be in the next couple of weeks so uh, get better, buddy, and I, I hope the surgery went well and, and hope to see you soon. Okay, so let me introduce now Dr. Sarah Seeger from MIT. Hi, hi, hi Sarah, how are you? Hi, everybody, good. We're all excited about the new Kepler news from today, and I'm, it's really great that we can be here, right? Basically, after I know, this is awesome. So tell us what just happened. What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that Kepler has been, has basically hit one of its most major milestones, and that is finding small planets in the habitable zone of stars that are close to being like our sun. And they have found, uh, th these started out, I guess, as planet candidates and then were later turned into uh, actual, pl they, these were planets, right? What's the distinction there? Well, actually, there's really three distinctions. First, we have something we call a planet candidate, which is a planet that, which is a signal that we think is from a planet but we're not 100% sure. Then at the other extreme, we have the planet where we have confirmed its planetary status. And usually that only happens if we have a mass for the object. In between, we have another word that's been adopted by the community, which we call planet validation. And for planet validation, it means we've done every test possible, or rather it's not me, but the Kepler team has done every test possible to show that it's pretty much certainly a planet and they actually will tell you how, what the false probability is. So for Ke for the yeah okay go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say so the way Kepler finds these planets for those of you who don't know is something called the transit method right they measure these small tiny dips in brightness as a planet moves in between uh, the the light from the star and our our field our point of view our field of view and so I guess when you say the signal the, there's a detection there's a there's a weak signal at first which makes it kind of a candidate. And then later on, they follow up, and if they can get its mass, then it's actually been confirmed. Is that what I heard? That's correct. Uh huh. And you know, in the old days before Kepler, that was the only thing that was acceptable. There was no word planet validation. Ah. So, but you can't get masses, can you, from the transit method? You need another way of 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 measuring these things, right? Almost always, we cannot get masses from the transit method, except there is one case actually, and that is we call it transit timing variation. Have transit. you heard that? Or? Yeah, what is that? I don't, I don't, I don't, I've not heard that. Well, this is really cool, actually. So what it is is that the planets, if there's more than one planet, they're actually mutually interacting based on gravity, even though they seem kind of far away from each other. And what's happening with those planets is instead of their transit being strictly periodic, so instead of a transit happening, for example, every 10.00 days, it may happen every 10 days, except for plus or minus 20 minutes. And that's because there's another planet in the system. And if they're all mutually interacting and all their transit times are off, you can actually pull out the masses of the planets in the system. 
So, so they can protect. They can project when the planet should be transiting, and if it's off by some time, like it's before or after or whatever, then they say something else must be pulling on it to exactly. affect that orbit, right? Right. Wow. So that's uh, cool. yeah, and they can actually construct. So that's pretty exciting. So now, uh, hold on, hold on. The planets actually have to be massive enough for that to happen. Otherwise, right, right. That's what I was going to say. Now, in the case, so in the specifics of this discovery, so why don't we talk about some of the, the specifics? They found five planets, right? Right. Well, there's two separate things going on now, but yes, there's a planetary system. It's now called Kepler 62. I'm just pulling up my copy of the paper here, so I can okay. see five planet system with two planets of two of the planets are in the habitable zone of that star. And the the cool thing about this is that the two planets that are in the habitable zone are Rock, they think they're rocky planets, right? I think they are, but let's get back to that later. We're okay, sure, sure. Okay, so, so, they found, so they found these planets. They've been confirmed. They've just now, they've just now decided that uh, these are, in fact, planets. And um, what about, so what about the star itself? How, what do we know about Kepler-62? Um, well, for Kepler-62, it's actually a star that's a little smaller than the sun. It's about two-thirds the size of our sun. It's only about a fifth as bright. So, you know, we kind of call that sun-like if we're just being generous with our definition. Sun-like, okay. So I'm looking at the paper also. It says it's a K2V spectral type with an estimated yeah. mass of 0.69 solar radi or solar masses, and it's about 0.63 uh, sol or, or solar radii in size. So um, do we know how far away it is, or where, where it's at in the sky? It's, well, it's in, it's in Cygnus, we're in the Kepler field of view, but do we yeah. know how far away it is? Well, we'll have to check more carefully in the paper, so let me just take a quick look. Yeah, I, I was just looking through that, too. Yeah. Okay. It's about 1,000 parsecs, so they're usually on the order of 1,000 to 3,000 1, 3, light years, typically. So the, mass, the paper also says that the masses of these planets could not be directly determined using radial velocity measurements. And so they had to, this is something, a question I had, to, I had for you that you might know something about. It said that they statistically validate the planetary nature of, 60, of, of Kepler 62b through f. By the way, whenever they, they, they name these planets, they start with the star name, which is Kepler 62, and then they add letters to it. Uh, little b, little c, little e, f, and g, and all that, depending on how many planets there are. You know what's funny is that they actually letter them in the order of discovery if they're not all found at once. So some planetary systems, the order of the lettering is not the order of the distance from the star. Oh, huh. yeah, that, I, I have noticed that actually for, in a couple of these. Our best example is 55 Cancri E. That was the last planet found, but it's the closest one to the star 55 Cancri E. Oh, okay. Cancri. Yeah. So, so since the radial velocity method couldn't get the masses from this, they said they used something called a blender procedure. Do you know what that is? I do, actually. And you know what's really cool about that is there's only like three people in the world who actually know how to do the blender procedure. Oh, cool. Yeah, the blender procedure is so named because um, it was actually myself and others who found the term and called it a blend. It's a false positive. When you see the transit light curve, there's really only one thing in nature that can mimic that light curve, and that is two stars that are orbiting each other. And if it's two stars orbiting and not a planet, if it's a star transiting and not a planet transiting, because a star blocks out more light than a planet, it'll have a very deep drop in brightness, a deep transit. But that transit can be shallowed out if there's a third star in the field of view, mixed together on the same pixel, blended together. And that extra star um, fills in the light curve. And so instead of having a planet transiting a star, you have a star transiting a star with a third star blending. Wow. I don't know if you get that. Maybe you want to re-explain that to me. Yeah, well, I, I, I guess I want to go through it again. So you need, right. so you, you have, you have, a, you have a, a planets orbiting a star, cutting off the, uh, or, or uh, m making the, the star brightness go down, and then I still don't get what the other star is doing. Um, okay, well, let's go over it one more time. We have the case we want. We're hoping the signal we see is a planet transiting a star. Right. A tiny drop in brightness that looks like a planet going in front of the star as seen from the telescope. Then we ask, what are the chances it's not that? What are the chances it's our most common false positive? Namely, there's three stars involved. Okay, so we have now a star transiting, a small star transiting another star, which gives us the transit signal. But if that was the only thing in the picture, we'd have a very deep transit because the star transiting blocks out more light. It has a bigger area than the planet. Okay? Okay. But that alone would look so different. We'd know that it was an eclipsing binary and not a planet transiting a star. Okay. So what makes that situation look like a planet transiting a star is a third star in the field of view in, on the same pixel. And that extra star just gives extra contaminating light. 
and it makes the deep transit more shallow. Okay, I guess my confusion comes from the, the trying to think about, yeah, you, we should know what light curves of eclipsing binaries look like. Why don't we just say that that's what it is? Uh, I, I still don't, I don't see how the light can go down uh, with another star passing in front of it. Well, the extra star is throwing an extra light to the system. Uh, yeah, okay. There's those two stars that are orbiting, yes, that, that signature would be very different from a planet transiting. But there's a third star that does nothing except add extra light in. And that extra light just messes up the signal from being uniquely binary. And in some cases, it can make it look like a planet transit. Okay, and so the, the, blender, the, so by, the blender then tries to differentiate those, those probabilities of whether it's, it's a, uh, a, a star, another star adding, adding extra signal to the system or if it's a transiting planet. Can you repeat that? So the blender, the blender technique just sort of, uh, it tries to differentiate when, when the difference between whether this is an actual planet going in front of the star or it's another uh, star in the system adding extra signal. Yeah. So if okay. you didn't understand anything that we talked about, just assume this. A blended scenario is bad. That's not a planet at all. So what Blender does, the Blender analysis, is they go through every possible combination of a blended star that could possibly mimic the transit signal at hand. And compare it with what they see. Yeah, and compare it with what they see. Just, okay. You know what? It actually involves using a supercomputer. There's so many different scenarios. And so it's so hard to do. They like have to consider all the different star types and then do they see that signature in any spectra taken and what does the light curve look like? What would it look like? Lots of stuff is going on there. Okay, I was making it more difficult than it was. Okay, so the, basically they're just trying to, they run it over and over trying all these different scenarios to see what else it could possibly be and see if they can get it to match. Well, to see what type measure. of three or four, three star system it could be essentially. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. All right. So, and, and so by doing that, by doing it on this system, they were able to rule out that this wasn't... Yeah, well, what's really cool about it is they give you an actual number. So let's see what they said for this. They actually tell you how likely it is to be really a planet and not a blended scenario. Mm -hmm. They usually quote that towards the end of the paper. I think it's really important, though, because now people are just saying they're all planets, whereas in the old days before Kepler, nobody would actually believe, no one accepted this type of paradigm. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does actually. So that's pretty cool. So it says that, uh, according to what I'm reading here, it says there is a 0.2% chance that the planets orbit a widely spaced binary composed of two, K, of two K2V stars, and therefore the planets are square root of two larger in radius and shown in table one. So I guess they're pretty sure. Well, you know, I always like, I mean, they are sure, but just sort of to play the devil's advocate. Mm -hmm. What do you think about 0.2% chance? Like, would you fly in an airplane if that had a 0.2% chance of crashing? Mm, I don't know. I'm a risk taker. <laughs> no, I probably, no, I would not. So, you know, that's... Yeah, yeah I know. It's, okay, so... It's not airtight at the 100.00000% level or anything. It's, it is what it is. But it's good enough. It's considered acceptable in this field. Yeah, yep, yeah, that's right. So it's certainly within uh, a lot of the other measurements they can make with Kepler. So, so Kepler, so Kepler found these things uh, over a period of time, right? They were they were doing these measurements over what was it uh, since May of two thousand nine through March twenty twelve. So this is this has taken a while to yeah, get. No, wait, this I just want to add one thing. I was just reading here. There, they said that the point two percent chance, but they also say that. Um, the odds ratio that the Kepler 62b through 62f represent planets, well, let's talk about E and F, represent planets rather than false positives. They give them those individual ones a much higher number. It's like mm -hmm. 1 in 15,000 and 1 in 5,000. Right. So actually, the numbers in general are much lower. I mean, the probabilities to be false is very low. Yes, so, uh, oh yeah, that, it's right above where I, where I was just reading. You're right, so that that's good. So, l let's... Uh, so we got we, we they've they've made these discoveries they've made these measurements over the course of many years and now we've they found these planets but and two of them supposedly are in the habitable zone. You want to talk about what that is? Oh, yeah, I can talk all about that. In fact, I just, <laughs> I just finished I'm finished in corrections to the proof of proofs of a review article on that that'll appear next week. Maybe appear next week or the week after in Science in the same journal. There's going to be actually a special edition of Science for exoplanets. It's coming out in a week or two. So, awesome. Yeah, what the habitable zone is, it's the zone around the star where heated by the star, a planet with an atmosphere made of 
nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and water vapor will have the right temperatures at the surface, as heated by the star, to have surface liquid water. And the reason why we use that definition of the habitable zone is because all life on Earth requires liquid water. And so without any really, we can get into if that's good or bad assumption, we want to find planets that could have surface liquid water. And that's the sort of what we call the conventional habitable zone. Take a planet with Earth's atmosphere, kind of change it a little, and figure out what the bounds are on the habitable zone. So these new planets fall within that region from their star where if with the right type of atmosphere, they could have liquid, they could, they will have the right surface temperatures to keep, to maintain liquid water. So I wanna, I'm looking at your paper and on this subject where, where you were saying that, you know, we can talk about why liquid water is important or not. I'm just going to uh, read a, is it all right if I read one sentence out of the, out of the paper? It, it, uh, it says that, uh, uh, it says that a National Academy's report concluded that although liquid, a liquid environment is required by life, it need not be limited to water. But they decide, and then I'm paraphrasing now, it says the search for life beyond the solar system still will focus on liquid water just because water is the most accessible, abundant, and common liquid in terms of planetary material. So everybody keeps wondering, you know, why are we so fixated on water? Why do we care about water, water, water? Why aren't we looking in other things? Surely there's forms of life that can arise that can come out of really hostile environments. They can live in sulfuric acid maybe, or they can do all kinds of stuff. But while that all may be true, what water, and I never really thought about it before this, this way, but I guess water is the most abundant liquid, right? It's abundant. I mean, let's just go back to your question for a minute, or your comment rather. There's this really great report by the National Academy of Sciences that's quoted in my paper, and yeah, they actually revisited the definition of, well, I won't say the definition of life, but requirements for life. And they said, let's just throw out water. Who knows if we really need water? But we need a liquid environment where molecules can break up and reform into more complicated things. And so that's why liquid. But you know what? People are looking, considering looking for life on other liquids. Like on Titan, Saturn's moon, Titan has methane and ethane lakes. And so there's a whole bunch of speculation about could there be life there. And people are thinking about concepts for engineering spacecraft that would drop probes that could be like submarines and look inside of those lakes. So certainly we are considering other ones. But it was another colleague of mine, William Baines, who pointed out in a paper in 2004 in astrobiology, he actually went over what are the liquids that exist at different temperatures as a function of distance from the star. And if you think about it in that way, you actually don't have that many options. In that case, water is the most abundant material. Yeah, I never, yeah. That, that, that's a great way to think about it. So what, what are some... Get, it just freezes. There's no liquids until you get out to that methane and ethane. Temperatures where methane and ethane can be liquid. So that's what it is. I mean, closer to the star, you could have liquid iron liquid metal at the surface, but how's that good for life? That's way too hot. <laughs> yeah, really. I'd like to see the life that could form yeah. in there. You know what? Actually, there's this, if you go to Yellowstone, it's pretty awesome. There's boiling water, like coming out of hot springs. Oh, and, sure, the geysers. Yeah. Back a long time ago, people put a glass slide in, and they came back later on and took it out, and there was life that could live in boiling water. Like, we can't live in boiling water, right? You know, if people fall into those boiling water hot springs, it's not good. They oh, I know, and I've, I've seen those things in, what are they called, um, uh, hydrothermal vents or something like that at the bottom of the sea. They, they, things are living down there, too. Not only, not only is it hot and boiling water, but it's got high pressure, too. The pressure down there is pretty, pretty yeah. high. So. Yeah, it's not that high in terms of for, for life, but yes. Well, but I guess so, yeah. Maybe, maybe to a microbe, it's not, not, so, not so bad. Interior to where Earth is, if you want to ask what is the next liquid in, that's abundant. That's stuff like iron and rock. And the liquid of those is so hot, if we were to like jump into that type of liquid, it would be game over instantly. Really? So the next, the next most abundant liquid next to water is... Well, you're going to make me have to look up the paper now, but well, yeah. No, no, no. Don't look it up. I was just... Uh, what, what, what are the other options? You said there aren't, aren't that many. Can you think of any? Can you maybe... you have any other uh, off the top of your head? No. So methane... Uh, but that's really cold, uh, and then maybe iron would be that would be super hot, and then of course water. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. Uh, so that that's a good that, that that's going to be my answer from now on when when people start to complain that well you know we're seeing fixated on liquid water. It's actually it makes a lot of sense in a lot of ways. I my answer before was always well you know we only have one data point for where we know life can arise, and that's Earth, and so we're going to start there. I mean, it's a reasonable starting point, and. Uh, it's possible life can be in all these other environments, but uh, 
right. but uh, we know for sure that it can exist here. So, uh, um, can we talk? I, um, I actually have a figure that I think shows this well. I don't know if you want to see it or not. Of course I want to see it. Do you need help with the screen share? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I want to share my screen right now, but yeah, we could. Well, the way, the way you would do it is when you hit that screen share button, it'll give you a list of windows. One of them will be the application where you're, go ahead and open up the image or the figure you want to show, and then you'll, you can click just that window, and it'll show it up on your screen. Okay, so let's see. That way you don't have to do the whole desktop. I'm do screen share, because otherwise they're just going to see us talking. Oh, I see. It's going to let me try to. Um, yeah. All right. Okay. I can do this. <laughs> And then how do I end it? Is it going to let me end screen share? After? Yeah, you just yeah, you just click it again. It okay. So let me put it up. I'm going to make it big. Okay, there it is. We're we're looking at it now. What I did was I pulled out a pa a figure from the paper Baines, 2004, and what he's showing you here is the uh he did his own likelihood calculation on the y-axis, but let's leave that out of it for now. He's showing you distance from the primary star in astronomical units. That's on, the, that's on the x-axis. Yeah, and you can see he's shown like where Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars would be. And you can see water could be liquid over quite a wide range. Mm -hmm. And beyond water, it's on a logarithmic scale. Then you get out to methane and ethane, and that's sort of at Jupiter, Saturn. And then you can keep going further out beyond planets that we have access to, like nitrogen or even hydrogen very far away. And closer to the star, he's just showing um, sulfuric acid here. But this sort of shows you, in terms of the materials we have in planets at hand, common materials, this is why we're focusing on water, actually. And it is a little misleading because it's a log-log plot. If we did this on a linear scale, it would be more obvious that water is the go-to. Oh, okay. That's amazing. Yeah. Liquid hydrogen. Look at that. <laughs> amazing. Okay. So, yeah, if you just click on the screen share, it'll take you back. Okay, so I want to pull up my... Let, let's see if we can pull up a little bit on the... Uh, Oops, hang on. Are you there, Sarah? Uh -huh. I'm just trying oh. to get into the screen. Oh, okay. I don't see the, um... oh, here it is, okay. Oh, the, yep, just press it again. Okay, so I have the, um, I have the Kepler-62 system up. Do you see it on the, on the screen there? Mm -hmm. yeah, so, there so the star they, what, what this is, is they have a comparison of the top of, the Kepler-62 is at the top, and our own solar system is in the bottom. And the first thing we notice is that the star is a little redder, a little bit smaller. Uh, the, the habitable zone is a little bit, uh, also a little bit, little bit smaller uh, and closer in. Um, and the planets, that they're, the, the planets that they're mostly interested in are the two uh, super-Earths, I guess, that are 62E and 62F. They are in the habitable zone itself. Do we know if they have any atmospheres? Well, we don't know for sure because we haven't seen atmospheres, but we are actually operating under this assumption that planets are born with material that wants to outgas into atmospheres. You know, like volcanoes and other things. Earlier on when they formed, it was a pretty crazy environment, we think, for most planets. So yes, I would say we're confident that these planets have atmospheres. And how would how do you how was that generally done? How do we find out? What's the best way for finding atmospheres? Well, that's such a great question, and I really hate to tell you, but for the Kepler planets, we are not going to be able to find out if they have atmospheres or not for these small planets because the Kepler stars and the planets are just too far away for us to observe them. Would but but how, okay, let's let's pretend they would. How would they? How would it be? Would it be spectroscopically or what? Would we be looking at the that's right. We'd want to look spectroscopically. Uh -huh. Okay. So would JWST maybe be able to see, resolve it? Well, not those particular ones. JWST could do the Kepler giant planets, for example. But we can... But not E and F. Not E and F. But you know what? Um, let's just go back. Let's just um, zoom out a little here. Okay. And remind ourselves what Kepler was supposed to do. Kepler's goal is to tell us how common Earth-sized planets are in habitable zones of sun-like stars. So Ke Kepler has way, has, is delivering on their... Kepler is delivering on Kepler's promise. Yes. But Kepler never told us that, oh, we're going to find planets. You can say that planet <laughs> is habitable. That planet has signs of life. That planet has oh, an atmosphere. Oh, so, don't get me wrong. I'm not blaming Kepler. I was, <laughs> I, I, I'm, not, I'm not dissing it. I was just wondering if, if, we, if we did happen to know uh, if there were atmospheres around it and if, if Kepler could see them. 
but it really never. I mean, I, I realize it's not some. What I was what I was hoping to get to was a discussion on how we find atmospheres for exoplanets. Yeah, we can. And, so and, we want to we want to do kind of Kepler again, if you will, but for stars much closer to Earth that are brighter, and whose planets we can follow up. And actually, we're doing that. Um, you know what? NASA has just selected the next mission that's complementary to Kepler. That's like the next thing in the line. It's called TESS, Transiting yes. Survey Satellite. Yeah. Awesome. So TEST is actually going to do that. And so how to find atmospheres is we look at them. We will actually be able to follow up some of the Kepler, some of the TESS habitable zone planets with the James Webb. So, let's, so you, since you brought it up, let's talk about TESS a little bit. Um, it is uh, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, which you've already talked about. And you are a, you're, a, you're a member of the – what's your role in the mission? I'm Koai. I'm on the science team. I'm the leading science team member, helping to organize the science activities that are going to be going on. And it's going to be, uh, and its main purpose is to? It is going to survey 500,000 stars that are sun-like stars, M stars, any kind of stars with planets up to, two to three, up to around about the two-month period mark. But TESS is going to do a lot of things. If you're doing an all-sky survey, which TESS is, you're going to find so many things out there. But what we really hope, the sort of gold dust in the whole TESS survey, are the rocky planets in the habitable zone of M stars, the small stars. And those planets have shorter periods than Earth. They may go around in, let's say, 10 days to one month to two months. Because those planets, we want to follow up their atmospheres with the James Webb Space Telescope. M stars are favorable for us now because the planet-to-star size ratio is favorable compared to an Earth to the Sun. Yes. Okay. I'm put, so I just put up a, a picture of the diagram from the from the website. Um, uh, what sort of uh, what sort of instruments is it going to have on board? When's it going to launch? Tell us some, some some of the details about it. Well, TESS is going to launch in 2017. Right now, it's planned for June of 2017. I know that sounds kind of like a long way off, but that's how long it's going to take to get it together. Oh, that's okay. We're used to it because we're waiting for JWST. <laughs> yeah. What you see here is this. You're actually looking at four cameras. They're essentially like four telephoto, specialized telephoto lenses with ginormous baffles to block sun and moon light. And those cameras, see how they're all kind of offset? They're pointed in different directions? That's mm -hmm. so that they can see um, a large chunk of the sky at one time. And it's, uh, you see the solar panels. Uh, it's the only deployable on tests, actually. And then you can see the spacecraft bus where all the communication and power and other things are going on. So TESS is going to go into a really fascinating orbit. If any of you can, do you have a link to the movie by any chance? Because I hope everybody can watch. There's a seven-minute movie on TESS. I can send I you can, I can certainly post a link to the movie. I don't think, uh, let me see, let me, let me, I'm on the web. I tell people why it's so cool. Why it's so cool is because Kepler, you know, um, Kepler's in a great orbit, but Kepler's in an Earth-trailing orbit. It's a very quiet environment. It's very dark. There's the night sky continuously. But it's very hard. To, that's an expensive orbit to get in. And communication is challenging. So TESS was a much smaller budget than Kepler. It can't really do an orbit like Kepler's. So TESS actually is a very clever orbit, and I encourage all of you to watch it on the video. What it does is it actually, it, well, the problem is that if you're, it's easy to go in low Earth orbit where, like, Hubble or, like, the space station is orbiting Earth. But in that case, you go through orbit day and night repeatedly. Every 90 minutes, you're going through orbit day and night. And orbit day is bad for transit observing because your telescope heats up and stuff expands, and you can't observe during orbit day. And so you have this constant cycling of thermal heat, which is not great, and you can't observe probably two-thirds of the time. So TESS has this great orbit where it's a 13.7-day orbit, and most it's elliptical, so most of that time, it's, if this is Earth, it's away from Earth, and then it comes back and zooms around and downlinks data and then goes back out again. And it's an inclined orbit, and it actually inclined orbit to Earth's plane, of orbit of the sun, and it's really cool because it's in a two-to-one orbit re resonance with the moon. So that's one of the things that we're excited about having found for TESS, a way that it can have almost continuous orbit night. Wow, that does not I, I tried to, while you were describing it, I tried to find it, but I, I couldn't get it quickly enough. So I will post a link to it once I find it in the description box of the video, though, so we can, so you guys well, can watch and see what we're talking about. I can post it because I have it. Oh, well then you should, yeah, definitely. Okay, let me see if I can figure this out. Um, where do I? 
So pull it up at, uh, at a window, and then and then when you hit screen share, you'll see all the options of the things you can screen you can share. I have a link. Is there somewhere I can just paste it? It's a YouTube link. Oh, it's a YouTube link. Um, just uh, just start playing it and screen and share your screen. Or you can send me the link, and I'll do it. Okay, I'll send you the link. So we may not want to watch it here, but as long as you post it, it'll be great. Yeah. So yeah, I'll uh, I'll definitely post the link for people to watch so they can see that. Okay. So while you're doing that, well, let me know when you're ready. <laughs> Ready. Okay, it. cool. So these two planets in the Kepler system are very are, are very close together. It looks like. I mean, they're, they're, uh, they're I think they're closer together than Earth is to Mars, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's really interesting is this system, Kepler sixty two, a five planet system, is that Kepler has found so many of these. We call them um, compact planetary systems. You see five transits. They're all very coplanar, and they're all tightly packed, tightly packed coplanar systems. So what's that's coplanar mean? What's coplanar mean? Coplanar means that the planets are all orbiting in the same plane, like okay. flat, basically. Okay. And so, then, yeah. mm -hmm. so what is that? What do, you, what do you, what implications do you think that might have for any life that might be there? Right, these two planets, both of which are in the in the habitable zone. I mean, it was like you were saying before, uh, or maybe I was reading it in the paper. The um, uh, while it could be argued that Venus is maybe in the habitable zone of our sun, it's certainly not very habitable because it's got run, that runaway greenhouse effect, right? So these two planets, while they're very close together, they're much closer than Earth and Mars are together. Uh, do you think that might have any, any uh, implications or, or effect on whether or not life arose in one or both or neither? How do you think that would, they would interact that way? I don't know. I mean, they're really, I don't, that's a great question, really ripe for speculation. I know some people are going to go crazy with panspermia, thinking that if life developed on one, a rock could have gotten knocked off and land on the other, but I'm not really sure. I don't yeah, I mean, yeah. to me, it would seem like if, if panspermia is a pretty common uh, mechanism for getting life onto a planet, then uh, something like um, having two planets that close together, I mean, even Earth and Mars, you know, we're still looking at rocks that are, you know, traveling back and forth between those two planets all the time. So um, who knows? If panspermia is a big mechanism for getting life started on a planet, they may have a lot in common, those two, those two worlds. It's, it's really cool. It's really something fun to think about. I, I really like the, uh, uh, the idea that those, those two are so close together that they might actually, I don't know, affect each other in that way. Just, I think it's kind of cool. Yeah. So um, you just move on to this. Let's talk about habitability a little bit more. Um, you, your, your, the, the paper that's coming up um, discusses quite a bit um, about you know what what the habitable zones are and uh, a little bit about not just, we talked a little bit about the water and and the different kinds of liquids that are out there, um, but what are some of the factors that you think that uh, sort of control or what are the factors that could, that 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 go into uh, controlling habitability? Well, simply put, we think the factors are the greenhouse gases. You know how here on Earth we're worried about carbon dioxide. We're worried about carbon dioxide increasing literally at part per million levels. That's tiny. Now imagine that carbon dioxide increased by a factor of 100 or 1,000, mm -hmm. or that our atmosphere was much more massive, and we just had a lot more carbon dioxide by definition. That's actually what we're thinking. And so it could be that these, even these Kepler planets, for example, at 1.4, 1.6 Earth radii, maybe they have more, they're more, maybe they're more massive than Earth. Maybe they have more mat massive greenhouse atmospheres making them just too hot at the surface. So that's one issue is that really whether or not a planet is habitable is going to depend a lot on their atmosphere. And honestly, we've just scratched the surface yeah. to try to understand what the atmospheres are going to be like. But there's yeah, actually we... more interesting stuff about it. What's that? There's actually even more interesting things that, have okay. that a lot of people um, have found in, in this field. And one of them is, let's take something else. This is not about the Kepler planets now, but imagine if we had a planet more massive it actually could hold on to hydrogen gas. And that would be really, really, really bad, actually, because... <laughs> Explosive. They, yeah, well, hydrogen is a very potent greenhouse gas. If the pressure is high enough, it turns out that it can... Um, if you want a more technical explanation, I can give it, but it absorbs radiation 
over a wide, wide range of wavelengths. And you know what else is it doesn't condense out. The reason why Mars and planets beyond Mars are not habitable is because carbon dioxide freezes out. So if you take your best greenhouse gas carbon, one of your best, green, your best greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide and water, and they're frozen on the surface, they're not going to heat your planet. But hydrogen doesn't condense out until you saw in that image that we looked at before, until very, 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 very cold temperatures. So actually, the habitable zone could extend outwards. And there have been authors who've even written about a habitable zone that literally goes to infinity, whereby if you had a rogue planet that was kicked out of the system that had hydrogen atmosphere that acted like a greenhouse blanket, and if the planet had some interior energy, it would still be able to maintain a warm surface. So for that to happen, it would need to be really big. Um, you know, what was weird was this paper, they didn't have to be that big. It just had to be like have radioactive energy and have a, had to have been ejected. Well, let's go into a little more detail here. It wouldn't have to be big. It would just have to have the right type of atmosphere. Now, well, I mean, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to get the hydrogen atmosphere. So in order, right, but in no, order to... The thing. We think even Earth may have had a partial hydrogen atmosphere before. So if a planet had a hydrogen atmosphere and got ejected and cooled down before it lost the hydrogen atmosphere, that's the scenario. I see. Okay. And uh, so li liquid water, that would be one factor, having the right temperature and, and uh, uh, distance and all that to keep liquid water, the pressures and stuff. Another factor you're saying is whether or not they have greenhouse gases. So they, you know, oh, whether or not they... Yeah. They're related because think of yes, the, greenhouse, I... yeah, yeah, the greenhouse gases, like a, think of it like a uh, temperature control, really. We just else? Point that, um well, it's primarily the greenhouse gases, but it turns yeah. out they're connected to almost everything else. Like, what's the planet made of on the inside that gave rise to those greenhouse gases? Did the planet lose its part of its atmosphere before? So it's connected to a lot of different planetary processes. But I'd say mainly it's the composition of the atmosphere and the distance from the host star. So the, the next, okay, so the next step then, I guess, once we've sort of gotten the habitability question down for a planet, it's, it's sort of finding some sort of, life next, right? Is anything alive on that planet? What are some of the things we look for to see if life might be there? What are some biosignatures that we might, that we might see in a, I don't know, a spectrum of a, of, a, uh, of a planet's atmosphere or something like that that might tell us life is there, something's alive? Well, the first thing is we have our favorite gases on Earth. That sounds mm -hmm. like a cop-out in a way, but we have oxygen under the right, right circumstances, methane, nitrous oxide, and those are, we would want to first look for things that we see on Earth that that uh, would be at least on Earth signs of life. But secondly, I've been working on biosignature gases for some time now. It's pretty remarkable, but life on Earth really produces almost any gas made of small molecules. So I think what we really want to do is just be open to the idea that was raised over half a century ago, that we're really just looking for gases that don't belong. Gases that are really far out of thermochemical equilibrium with the atmosphere. And so, you know, one answer is I could go through a list and I could list like 10 or 20 things that people have thought of. But the other answer is just that, wow, whatever, we want to be able to see the atmosphere and understand what's in there and get good enough data to identify molecules there. Awesome. So, yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm just trying to get my head around that. So anything that's, that's uh, uh, what we find here on Earth, as well as just these wide range of almost any gases. Sure, I'll give you a couple of examples. On Earth, we have um, oxygen which if someone's looking at, it, looking at us from far away, aliens say, um, they would know, hopefully, that we shouldn't have oxygen in our atmosphere. It's so reactive, honestly, we should have basically nothing. Yet we have 20% of our atmosphere is filled with oxygen, 20% by volume, and that's produced by plants and photosynthetic bacteria. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. We, have another, we have another one that's produced in small amounts, but it's called DMS, dimethyl sulfide. And that one shouldn't be in our atmosphere, although it's there in only tiny amounts. There may be a planet where it could accumulate to much larger values. But that's actually produced by phytoplankton. And no one knows totally why. It may be when the phytoplankton are under stress or it's a signaling hormone. But it's actually released into the air. And so those are just two um, examples of what life on Earth does. Yeah. So I, I, as you were uh, talking, I was going through the, uh, some of the comments. And we're running out of time. So I want to make sure we start to get some of the comments and questions in. Um, I'm looking at the YouTube page right now, and um, so uh, what, a question from B. Balaban2190 from YouTube goes, how will JWST and Giant Magellan European 
extremely large telescope impact our understanding of exoplanets, potentially life on them? Great question. Yes. If we have the right planet to look at, the James Webb can look at atmospheres of small planets transiting of small stars. And you know, if we get really lucky with the James Webb, we're going to do another Google Hangout on this particular topic later, we will see signs of life. If there is a planet around a nearby M star with signs of life in the atmosphere, and JWC has enough telescope time to look at that planet, then we'll find life on that planet if it's there. I'd which, say it's, which it's, is awesome. That is awesome. <laughs> um, but, you know, there's a lot of ifs. It's actually that would be like winning the lottery five times in a row. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I didn't want you to think it was that easy. You remember? Yeah. Yeah. Reality, yeah. reality check. Yeah. Reality check. LPs, the extremely large telescopes that are going to be 20, 30, 40 meters. That's I'd say still under debate by the community. Some people like me, I'd say, well, forget it because it's going to be hard for them to, um, Earth's atmosphere is really bad. It's so blurry. It's like, you know, if you swim at the bottom of a swimming pool and you look up, you can't really see clearly. That's kind of what our atmosphere does for looking really precisely at stars and planets. So some people think we'll be able to get around our problems and we'll be able to find Earths with the big telescopes. And not only that, we'll be able to study atmospheres of small planets. I think that's going to be a challenge because we have to deal with our own atmosphere and we're presumably trying to look at features just like our own atmosphere has. So just to be a little tiny bit more technical, people will then argue, well, we'll be fine because our planet has a Doppler velocity because we're moving through space and therefore the other planet's signal will be offset. So we're still debating what the ELTs will do for terrestrial planet exoplanet science. Okay, so I'm moving. Moving on now to Dryadash, who also on YouTube goes, Hello, Wall, can we consider that Mars and Venus are in the habitable zone? And I think we talked about that briefly. Oh, yeah, uh, I'm talk about this, okay? I really hope you guys can see my article. It's just we couldn't really make it public here because it's not ready. But Yeah. Okay, so some people um, believe that both Mars and Venus had water. We're pretty confident Mars had at least episodic events of water on, the pa on its surface in the past. Most people, but not all, believe that Venus had surface water on the past. So just based on those empirical arguments, sure, why not include them in the habitable zone? But they don't have it today. So that's one way to answer the question. Mm -hmm. Then you have the group of people who do really complicated models. And one of those groups found that, that the habitable zone doesn't include Venus. And in fact, ends at 0.99 AU when we're at 1 AU. So we don't have a great answer for you. If we had water in the past, maybe we want to call it habitable. On the other hand, models can't really agree that Venus should be included. Right, and we, just because it's in the habitable zone like we talked about doesn't mean it's actually, uh, doesn't mean it's actually habitable. Like, okay, I'm looking at the uh, Google event page, right, or the G Plus event page, and Andrew Planets made a, uh, uh, a comment here that goes, it's really impractical only to order planets around stars in the order they've been found. I wish they would hold a convention on the matter like they did on dwarf planets and to have them described in consecutive distances from the star. I vote that we would make them that it would make them easier to memorize. I mean, definitely. The problem is that papers have now, like, let's take 55 Cancri E again. Papers on all the other 55 Cancri planets, B, C, D, they already came out. Many papers were written and published. So how do we go back and change all the titles of those papers or our search databases so that we have a handle on which planet we're looking for that was already written about before the latest one was discovered? So that's the problem we're facing. Um, we'd have to think about maybe you'd wait a couple of years and assume you found everything you need. That would be challenging. Yeah, and uh, um, I don't know. I guess I guess with with respect to um, how people name things, astronomers have never been uh, particularly easy about it either. <laughs> What's interesting is that there's this com company called Uwingu, and they're trying to raise money just to do space engineering. It's led by Alan Stern. And they've decided to just name planets. You can vote to name a planet and pay for that right to vote, I believe. And recently, the IAU, the same people who voted to demote Pluto, by the way, science should not be done by voting. The same body who names things, International Astronomical Union, they sent out a pretty strong message saying that they don't find that acceptable. So what happened? That reminds me of the, the, when they were naming Pluto's moons. What, what happened with that? Oh, I don't know, actually. I yeah, because... They were. There was a big vote where they were. Uh, they were voting. Um, I think even NASA. NASA had some links on their page about it too, and I wondered about that. I wondered if the IAU was going to even uh, uh, recognize it, but I don't remember uh, if they were or not. So yeah, this. I agree. This the the, the whole thing with uh, voting and everything else is not not really where. It, right, but I think Andrew Planet raises a good point that. 
it'd be so awesome to give these planets some kind of name that we all agreed on and could all celebrate. But yeah, we, he all, and Andrew also says the thing with panspermia. No matter where the original building blocks of life come from, you still need a habitable zone. That's true. That's very right. True. We're just saying it may be different for each planet. Yeah. Okay, I'm back on YouTube. Um, be, be, oh boy, Benias51. Where does Professor Seeger work? We said that early on. She works at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. She's an astrophysicist and planetary astronomer, and she's also working on all these different missions. You want to give us a, a highlight of some of the things you're working on right now? Well, the test mission is one. Uh, I also have my own mission. Hold on one second. I'm going to just get it. Okay. Get my space telescope that we're building here. This is one isn't the actual telescope, but this is actually the real um, size. See, it's like the loaf of, it's basically the size of a loaf of bread. That's the actual spacecraft. It's not the actual spacecraft. It's a demo. It's a basically an illustration model, you can call it. But yeah, uh huh. Mm. And actually, this is going to be light Kepler and tests, but it's going to look at the very, very nearest sun-like stars. Maybe the. Mm, if we do it right, we'll narrow it down to a few hundred that are suitable that may have very small planets like Earth, brightest sun-like stars really nearby. But we need one of these per planet, one of these per star rather, because those bright stars are spread all around the sky, and we can't use a single telescope for that. So this is pretty much one of my main projects right now. Wow. So that, what's, uh, what's on the end there? Is that the, is that the uh, objective? What is that? This here is um, the lens. There's no yeah. baffle shown here. There'd also be a baffle. Um, on this end here, we have what we call a reactional unit. It's just a block of metal, but inside would be a reactional unit, three reaction wheels that actually position the telescope. But a little space satellite like this, it gets pushed around very easily. By so what? By gravity by the Earth's magnetic field by lots of things. Okay. Um, actually, the reaction wheels themselves aren't perfect, and when they spin, they cause a vibration in the telescope. So we also have this block of metal here that represents, um, it's attached to the focal plane, and a software algorithm makes it so that as the stars start to drift out of their pixels, the center of the star drifts out of a pixel, fraction of a pixel, this moves it back. It's like, you know, have you ever used those um, binoculars that you press a button and the image stabilize? Mm -hmm. This essentially is an image stabilizer to correct for the fact that this thing can't point perfectly. So how would they be launched? These would be launched as piggyback rides, basically. This is, uh, for anyone who knows what a CubeSat is, this is a three-unit CubeSat, and it would be launched in what they call a Peapod. It's a standardized deployer that goes on many different launch vehicles. So just whatever happens to be launching, you put one of those in and, and, it, and they'll, they'll stick it in there, it gets launched, yeah, and then it deploys to, itself? You have to try to match up with one that's going to an orbit you actually want to go to. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, you don't want to just get in, go anywhere. So when we do our prototype, we'll just get that free ride. But when, our, when it comes time to doing the fleet, the 50 telescopes, we'll probably have our own launch vehicle and go into our own precisely chosen orbit. So how are you choosing the stars that they'll look well, at? First of all, the prototype will go up and look at stars with planets that are known from radial velocity, but they're not known to transit. And there's a few dozen super-Earth planets like that. We can't see if they transit from the ground because of the blurring effects of Earth's atmosphere. The second thing the prototype will do is it'll look at the 20 brightest sun-like stars, looking for some of these awesome, kept, you know, the, remember we talked about those tightly packed, compact systems? Mm -hmm. Well, we have no way to find those around our nearest sun-like stars. We don't have any way to find them with any other technique. So we'll look for those. And that's what the single prototype will do. When we send up the fleet, I'm going to just try to explain this for people who have some background in this field. That's a little more complicated because if we really wanted to say, if there's a transiting Earth around a star brighter than 8th magnitude, we will find it. That would be hard because there's thousands of stars. So we have to narrow down that list of thousands of stars to hundreds of stars to make it more tractable. And how we're going to do that? We're going to try to find out the star's axis of rotation. And assuming that we're going to get more and more evidence that planets orbit in the plane, we want to find all the stars that go like this. Now, that's a much harder problem, and we'll try to do that with asteroid seismology. We're still working on how we have enough time to get that done. So let me see that again. Let me point the, uh, point the uh, uh, objective at it. I want to see the, I want to see the, the lens yeah. again. What this is it? That's like four inches, something like that? Uh, yeah, something like that. Yeah, I mean, wow. About That's eight a... centimeters. But basically, yeah, 
It's and how sensitive is and, and the detectors that are in the back? What what are they just is it, is this off the shelf stuff or what? You know, not exactly. The I mean, they're off the shelf in terms of they're not customly made. They are CMOS detectors uh, for people who know what those are. Yeah. Essentially, it's almost like this. I won't say it's the same thing that you have in your iPhone, but it's really the same kind of detector. Yeah, but they all have CMOS. Most, yeah. most cameras now are CMOS cameras. But the ones we have here, they're actually specially made for um, guide cameras, cameras that would go up and be attached to like a bigger telescope or a bigger spacecraft and look at stars in the sky. Oh, okay. And uh, what what wavelength? Uh, any particular wavelength you're interested in, or does it matter? Just just a visible light. As many photons as possible, so we're yeah. all visible. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Okay. I was just yeah, and I guess in this sense, when you're trying to just detect these these uh, transits, you don't need to have you know uh, like infrared sensitivities and things like that. Right. No, and that just complicates things because you'd have to cool and, and things like that. Wrong. Wow, that's really cool. And and I'm sorry, you might you might have said it, and I forgot. When 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 are you hoping to launch the first one? Well, we're still raising money to finish our project. We oh, okay. From concept, kind of halfway two-thirds of the way of technology development. And now we just need to get more money to finish it off. So oh, okay. All right. So all of this is still indeterminate based on funding. Yes. That's okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, that's let me, so let me see if we got any other comments coming in from, oops, hang on just a sec. Um, okay. So let's see. Uh, Extronus on YouTube goes, does telescopes reach their sensitivity limit or in future, a picture like the Hubble Deep Field can be taken with, say, a one-second exposure. Let me see if I can understand that. Does do telescopes reach their, their sensitivity limit? Oh, have they reached their sensitivity limit? Or a future picture? So, okay, I think I understand. So, we we have reached a lot of limits with what we can see with current telescopes, and in particular, the Hubble Space Telescope is um, reaching its limit as far as what it can show us in terms of most distant galaxies, right? I mean, we, we use tricks like uh, uh, gravitational lensing and things like that to make use the universe as kind of a telescope to make things brighter. But basically, to see the most distant part of the, the universe, Hubble has b basically been maxed out. And so that's why you build things like the, w the Webb Space Telescope. That's the next generation. It's got a much bigger mirror. You'll be able to see a lot further back in time because of it can, ca it can gather more photons. It'll also have higher resolution. And it's sensitive in a part of the spectrum that is necessary to see these faraway things, which is the infrared. So, um, uh, however, that limit is not the end of the world. It's just one of the things it can't see much uh, further back in time, but still does a lot of great science. And that's also true with the ground-based telescopes that we have on, on the ground now. We have the very large telescope uh, doing very good work, even though they're building things like the extremely large telescope and the ridiculously huge enormous uh, large telescope in the future so the 30 meter telescope is coming online at some point. Yeah, let me just say one more thing it's like yeah. we probably can't do the Hubble deep field in a second anytime because we need a much bigger telescope. Right, that's it. So right. And, and, put a, the James Webb is the Hubble's 2.4 meters in diameter the James Webb is effectively six and a half meters but we don't know how to do like a hundred meters in space we actually have no way to do that right now which is what we need. <laughs> yeah, we'd have to probably build it in, in segments uh, like we did the space station or something. Yeah, in space. Mm -hmm. yeah but uh, uh, no, as far as in, in exposure time, basically limit your lim is determined by the size of your objective uh, in, in many ways, in the sensitivity of your of your instrument. So uh, it's not that big a deal to take things a little bit longer uh, exposure. Having a one second exposure isn't really something that helps you much. Uh, in all that many things anyway, so um, it keeps noise down, I guess, but that's about it. Uh, it there's nothing there's nothing wrong with having multi-hour uh, uh, exposures. In fact, astronomy is, is very, very used to that, and we've got a lot of good techniques for, for taking those. Um, okay, let's let me uh, go back again real quick and see. Uh, any more comments? What would be, oh, uh, Shea Van Doom? Goes. What would be the next step after identifying planets in habitable zones? This is from YouTube. Well, with Kepler, there's no next step because we're just trying to accumulate how many there are, how many planets around, how many stars are in habitable zones. Once yeah. we have that information, we want to try to repeat the Kepler effort, but to stars that aren't thousands of light years away, but that are tens, few to tens of light years away. And so the next step is figuring out how to do that. 
Okay, so I think uh, I think that's where we will leave it since we are running out of time. Any last minute, uh, any, any any parting comments you'd like to make, Sarah? Only that it's really great that Kepler has reached this next milestone. And personally, I just hope that Kepler is going to continue to find these planets in the habitable zone. And in our best case scenario, tell us that every star like the sun has at least one planet in the habitable zone. That would be awesome. How much longer is Kepler going to be running? Well, we hope it's going to keep running indefinitely until it finds <laughs> the planets we're looking for. Kepler has actually passed its nominal three and a half year mission. So it was built to last three and a half years. Um, and it's actually doing better than you have, like you buy a washing machine and it has a warranty and then the day after the warranty expires it breaks. It's actually doing better than that. But the <laughs> problem is it's having a bit of a problem right now. It had four reaction wheels. You need three to point it precisely and it needs to be pointed precisely. One failed already and another one's in trouble. So we're all keeping our fingers crossed that that in trouble reaction wheel is going to hold out long enough. We need it for another couple of more years. Yes, really. That would be great. And, and, and is, is there any other... It doesn't have any expendables or anything like that that would it would uh, run also, it's out or anything. Expendable because it has to turn itself, but I think that isn't in. It's not in danger of running out. Oh, okay. All right. Well, great. Yeah, that's hoping those wheels that's those wheels uh, uh, stay stay healthy, and we keep getting lots of great data from Kepler. It is doing amazing work, and uh, it's, none, it's all of this is exactly what it was designed to do. So, uh, Sarah, I want to thank you so much for joining me. This is great. We're going to be. By the way, guys, this is the first of many. Sarah and I are going to, and, and Alberto when he gets ready, and Jason when he's free. We're all going to get together on a regular basis and talk about exoplanets. And Sarah has uh, agreed to join us for these as uh, often as her schedule allows. So look for more of these in the future. Uh, keep thinking about exoplanet questions and make sure you, you store them up for when we're, we're online next. I think the next one will be um, in the, I think we had, I, I had tentatively scheduled it for the first week, uh, first Wednesday of May. So uh, look for it around that time. And then that week, every month after. So um, I'm sorry, that week, every, yeah, every month after. So we'll be doing those on a regular basis. The next topic, I think, uh, is going to be a really interesting one. I don't want to give too much away, but we're going we're gonna to discuss a few things about the Drake equation again, but we got a twist on it this time, and we're going to talk about that uh, in, in, in the next one coming up uh, next month. Alberto, get ready, get well, buddy. I hope I feel I feel bad that you're sitting there laid up with your knee probably stuck up in the air getting getting a <laughs> getting a throbbing pain or whatever it is. I don't I've never been through ACL surgery, but I hope it's not too bad uh, too bad for you. Heal up so that you can go back to whatever it was you were doing when you got it injured in the first place. I think it was playing fullback for the Ravens or something like that. I forget what it was. Anyway, anyway, get well, buddy. I look forward to seeing you guys soon. Sarah, thank you so much for joining me. And that's it for this week, Space Fans. We will see you soon. See you next month. See you. Bye-bye.